Hello and welcome to another episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm Krish Mohan. Let's get a little personal here for a minute. Don't worry, I'm not going to take my pants off here or, or cry at you about hugs I didn't receive. It's cold, so pants are a necessity and hugs are plenty where I am. Personal in terms of who I am and where some of my perspectives come from. I'm an immigrant that moved to the States when I was about eight years old. Most of you that follow my comedy know that already, but what people might not know is that when I came here, I did not fit into American standards at all. I know that's not a shocking revelation or anything, right? Immigrants not fitting in is basically what this country is founded on. It was even the little things that made me stick out like a goth kid in high school. I know you think people don't see you, Reggie, but we can all see you. You're wearing all black in a very bright hallway. Contrast is a beautiful thing. We'd hug you, but the spikes are kind of a hug hazard. Anyway, I can remember certain phrases that would get me in trouble like rubber. That's an eraser in India, but in the States I got lectured about how that means condom. And I didn't really know what a condom was either. I was eight. Eventually I learned about it through the internet and with the help of my so-called friends. Bathrooms are called restrooms? Why? I mean, as far as I can tell, no one is resting when we're all packed into a room with dim lighting, holding our junks four inches from another person of the same sex. There's no couches, and, and no one brings you drinks or, or juice. No rest. The only time I felt restful in a restroom is when they're the family-style gender binary bathrooms. I had to either conform to these norms and not ask my questions or be isolated, cursed and shunned to sit alone at the lunch table. Not even Reggie the Got Kid would come sit by me, but that might be to prove that he was mysterious in his brooding. We can still see you, Reggie. Your AFI makeup and poetry are not cloaks of invisibility. Again, the spikes are really difficult for human contact to get through. Now, this brings up the argument of the collective versus the individual. Which ideology will progress society farther? According to Objectivism 101, individualism, which states that each individual is, is acting on his or her own, making their own choices to the extent that they interact with the rest of the group it's as individuals. Collectivism is the second way, and it views the group as the primary entity with the individuals lost along the way. As far as America and Western society is concerned, it's an individualistic society. You think about yourself and your immediate family, and that's that. Once you're an adult, you make your own money, you live in your own place, and if anything gets between you and your goals, you punch it out of the way. This is why Reggie sits alone, because nobody gets him and his poetry. Capitalistic competition breeds individualism. It's an economic system based in winners and losers. There's a prize and someone is going to get it. Don't you want that to be you? Wait, what, what's the prize? That is the kind of question that is not what individualistic capitalism is about. And now, nobody gets the prize. Fame is an individualistic idea. You are the one that leads the peons with your art or whatever your choice of profit and manipulation is. A lot of us are still trying to go viral. And... That's another phrase that doesn't really make sense to my little immigrant mind. Why would you want to compare yourself to something that spreads around and kills people? I'd like to go antidote, please. Counter the viral videos. 
fame and climbing the corporate ladder can only be achieved if you do and follow what the individuals controlling that fame and that ladder want you to say or do. So the individualism preached in America and other westernized countries is manufactured, like a car or a pair of headphones. It's a product to be bought and sold. It's part of the collectives that tells you you're an individual by buying and doing what everyone else does. If you're a skeptical person that looks to figuring out how the world works and why it works the way it does and whether we can change the systems that aren't working, you're probably more of an individualistic thinker. But because you're asking questions, you don't win and you sit at the lunch table alone with a big scarlet L on your forehead. How many times has any of us that, that think skeptically, that, that are true free thinkers, I've been told by our parents, why can't you behave like so-and-so? They follow all the rules. If I had a penny for every time that I was asked that, I would, I would have like, like $8. Now, that's not to say that collectivism is all good or all bad either. It is how we arrived where we are, collective tribes working together for survival. Hell, I mean, we even partnered with canines and made them a part of our collective to help us survive. Cross-species collectivism. The major fear here is that you're part of a collective, you will lose your unique identity. You know the one that you're told you have? We would be lost to the void of the hive mind. Now the examples I just gave you are how these ideas are twisted and used as a form of manipulation to deem what is and isn't normal. And the abnormal is cast out so the normal individuals can hold on to their freedoms that they are told they have. A great example of this is how whistleblowers are seen worldwide. People like Snowden, who leaked the news of the massive surveillance state we live under to journalists, or Julian Assange of WikiLeaks, or Chelsea Manning, who revealed autocracies committed by the U.S. military, are not viewed as heroes or even brave for what they did. Their individualism is seen as traitorous by some. And yes, if you're an individualistic, free-thinking person, you'd say that those people have every right to disagree with the actions of the whistleblower. But if we look at what a surveillance state does to people, we'd think otherwise. If we are being watched at all times, or, or even the notion of that, we are going to act and behave completely differently in fear of judgment, shame, and punishment. The reason is, is that when we're in a state where we can be monitored, where we can be watched, our behavior changes dramatically. The range of behavioral options that we consider when we think we're being watched severely reduce. This is just a fact of human nature that has been recognized in social science and in literature and in religion and in virtually every field of discipline. There are dozens of psychological studies that prove that when somebody knows that they might be watched, the behavior they engage in is vastly more conformist and compliant. Human shame is a very powerful motivator, as is the desire to avoid it. And that's the reason why people, when they're in a state of being watched, make decisions not that are the byproduct of their own agency, but that are about the expectations that others have of them or the mandates of societal orthodoxy. One of the arguments used against Edward Snowden is that he could have sold these secrets to America's enemies and made a bunch of money. Wait, wouldn't that make him the winner of the individualistic capitalist game? Wouldn't, wouldn't he get the prize? As Glenn Greenwald put it so eloquently in his 2014 TED Talk. I've not seen yet. No, I consider that absurd and idiotic. Um, if you wanted to, um, and I know you're just playing devil's advocate, um, 
But uh, you know, if you were, if you wanted to sell secrets to another country, which he could have done and become extremely rich doing so, the last thing you would do is take those secrets and give them to journalists and ask journalists to publish them because it makes those secrets worthless. People who want to enrich themselves do it secretly by selling secrets to the government. But I think there's one important point worth making, which is that accusation comes from people in the U.S. government, from people in the media who are loyalists to these various governments. And I think a lot of times when people make accusations like that about other people, oh, he can't really be doing this for print principled reasons, he must have some corrupt, nefarious reason, they're saying a lot more about themselves than they are the target of their accusations because those people, the ones who make that accusation, they themselves never act for any reason other than corrupt reasons. So they assume that everybody else is plagued by the same disease of soullessness as they are. Um, and so oh. that's the assumption. And that's part of the collectivist mindset, to think that the world is as corrupt or benevolent as the individual. Collectivism is used as a way to wrap people into conformity for the sake of a larger goal like the nation, or a religion, or a stamp. Japan, a society known for its collectivism, has a few sayings. The nail that sticks out gets hammered down, and the shot hits the bird that pokes its head out. Clearly, Japan's ideas on collectivism was written by a serial killer, like Dexter. Wraps up body parts in saran wraps and kills birds at night, but they're a super chill philosopher during the day that builds homes for the homeless. Phrases like that are why people fear a fully collectivist society. Being something different, expressing ideas and questions, means you get hammered down and shot. Bit of an overkill in my opinion, but I'd rather not get shot by a hammer. There is a possible genetic reason why Eastern cultures lean towards a more collectivist ideology. And it's connected to serotonin transportation. This is controlled by a gene that expresses itself in a long version and a short version. East Asian cultures, for the most part, have the short version of the gene, which means less serotonin transportation and less happiness and more collectivist ideals. This is called the anti-psychopathology. So what does all that mean? It basically means that when you're part of a collective, you have less pressures and less external stresses. So less pressure from competition, economic stresses that come from adulting, less dating pressure, so Tinder is basically your parents. I mean, arranged marriage is literally Tinder with parental control. But it's all for the collective, like a family. Right? Eastern cultures don't kick their kids out and put their old people in homes. They're all under one roof. The primary objective is taking care of the family. A major value of collectivism is to take care of each other. But, as I mentioned earlier, these ideologies can work, but right now they're twisted up and polarized. By means of control, they are used against the people they're supposed to help. In my opinion, they are the failures of these ideologies. The failures of collectivism is nationalism and the corporate state. It's used as a mean to pit us against each other because we don't have the same skin color or wear the same hat or have the same bearded god. The failures of individualism is greed and the corporate state. It's used as a mean to pit us against each other because only your goals are important and you must achieve them by any means necessary. The corporate state perpetuates both these ideologies by telling you that without the right job, right salary, right car, you can't be that cool individual or part of the cool kids crew. Back to the loner lunch table with you, you rebellious fiend. 
Advertisements from the corporate state is where the words nerds, intellectual, bookworm were all tainted to mean awful, insidious things out to steal your freedom like a sacred jewel from a fantasy novel. A great example of this is the current example of the US, Donald Trump. The greed of his individualism is in the tax bill that the GOP passed, which guts the middle class to inflate the corporate sector. It's in cutting health care for the people and leaving it up to the rich to dole out if they please. It's in the amount of hair gel he uses every morning. It's, it's enough oil to drown an entire fleet of seals. Right now, Trump and North Korean dictator King, Kim Jong-un are at odds with each other over a dick measuring contest, ironically, over a button. Kim Jong-un has claimed that his nuclear button is right on his desk, and Trump said, so is his, but his is burger. That's the failure of individualism at its finest. Why would the leader of the world's largest and most overfunded military talk like this? Well, it's because the only time the collective of the mainstream media praised him is when he participated in an act of war. When he bombed the Syrian airbase back in April of last year and dropped the mother of all bombs, Brian Williams had his first orgasm since the Bush era on national television. He was finally called presidential. They called Trump presidential because he did that. The collective praised his individualism for pushing war, and now he thinks that's what a president does. And for anyone that supports Trump's but hates whistleblowers like Snowden, just know that this makes America way less secure than revealing the surveillance states. Trump's boasts are basically saying there is a large button on the desk at the White House. And it's got all the nuclear codes sitting on a desk, and it's huge. If the nuclear codes are less secure than my iPhone, then your military shouldn't be taken seriously. I think the War Department of the United States, you know, the one that masquerades as the Defense Department, owes the American people a ton of money back, and... An apology to Edward Snowden. Although, this would not be surprising that if the nuclear codes are said to be on this desk and somebody does break in to find this button that has all the nuclear codes and they get in and they, and they find the desk and, and then they look at the desk and it's, and it's just a naked Trump with, with just his dick on the table. The, that really wouldn't, wouldn't be shocking in this situation at all. These failures are a myopic view on a much larger picture. What we are missing is the idea of the Gestalt. The Gestalt principle says the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. I learned about Gestalt in my freshman year of art class in high school, which just goes to show that even the basics of art can reveal the intricacies of a growing universe. Which is why those that want to control and manipulate everything end up cutting art education first. Art helps you think and develop as an individual that might help out the collective. We as human beings have the ability to take in complex pieces of information and figure out what to do with it. Finding meaning and the bigger picture in the surrounded chaos. Individualism and collectivism are two parts of this. The collective can make sure that the individual is taken care of and through the pursuit of their happiness, they are giving back to the collective. Sums of a whole. We need to make these ideologies work together for we the people. We can be individuals with questions, creativity, and the choice to be what and who we want to be in the world. Both sides of the political aisle talk about this. The freedom of choice 
does come with consequences, but that's where collectivism comes in. Instead of the collective shunning, shaming, and punishing those that are different from them, they can take part in that individualism and ask questions and learn. Maybe the goth kid can take off that spiky jacket and come in for that hug. Then you can ask what their poetry means. Collectivism can't work when it's ruled by fear, and individualism can't work with bread competition. Those are polarizing ideas that don't work alone, even though that's what individualism wants you to believe. We're already filled with so many different polarizing ideas. Left versus right, Democrats versus Republicans, cat people versus dog lovers, and so on. But true change and true solutions lie somewhere in between. They lie in the best versions of these ideas. They come to fruition when we start seeing the whole picture instead of the world through a small lens. The real fallacy of polarizing ideas? We don't learn and we don't evolve. We remain stagnant in a world that thinks punishment is the consequence of being different, rather than education. Yes, collectivism helped the early humans survive, but individualism helped them come up with those tools and use fire. Learn about the world around them, and when the collective embraced those ideas, we progressed. When the kids finally sat with me at lunch, I was able to learn what a condom was, albeit horrifically. I mean, no boy should have witnessed the autocracies committed to produce that day. But I learned, damn it. And they learned where I was from, and that there wasn't a whole lot to fear. Until we are ready to accept the vastness of the world we live in, we're going to be drenched in polarized debates, control, and manipulation. Once we accept the vastness, we can explore, learn, teach, and create. Till then, we will be battling not just with weapons, but with ideologies trying to win a prize that probably doesn't exist. That's been your Forkful of Noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video, uh, give it a like, give it a thumbs up, and give it a share. Sharing is caring, and it helps independent media like this show reach more people. Uh, independent media's reach is constantly being censored by various forms of uh, censorship from social media and uh, other internet giants. So sharing from you guys is a great way to help this show. Uh, I have live stand-up comedy dates coming up in Washington, D.C., Richmond, Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia, Knoxville, Tennessee, Montgomery, Alabama, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Memphis, Tennessee, and St. Louis, Missouri. I'll be on the road with a great comedian named Andrew Frank. So if you guys are out there, uh, come check us out. Come check out the Anti-Imperialism Nationwide Comedy Takeover. Uh, you can find all those dates available on my website at ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. You can go and check out the details, join the events on Facebook, get your tickets for these shows, uh, and join in the conversation. Uh, and while you're there, you can also download all of my albums from Bandcamp. You can go to ramennoodlescomedy.bandcamp.com. Uh, and if you subscribe to the Bandcamp, you get new stand-up comedy material every single month. These are unreleased uh, comedy materials specifically for people that subscribe to the Bandcamp. Um, so uh, if you want to subscribe and throw a couple shekels there, you can do that there. Uh, while we're talking about crowdsourcing, I have also relaunched my Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash haha. And what this does is it helps this show grow. It helps the quality and the, the work put into this show because uh, it's all done by me. I'm the only staff member, only writer, only producer, only videographer on the show. So it's a lot of work on my end to, to bring this to you guys. Uh, and it, donating uh, any amount helps the show get better. Uh, it helps um, all of my projects uh, evolve and become something more. 
and you guys don't have to donate anything at all if you can't obviously this show will always be available for free uh and and for your listening pleasure so uh once again you can go to ramen noodles comedy.bandcamp.com it's r-a-m-a-n noodles comedy dot bandcamp dot com or go to patreon at patreon dot com slash krishmohan haha you can also make a one time donation which all these links are in the description of the video below uh if you guys enjoyed this uh let me know leave a comment if you'd like as well um uh, future episodes are going to cover bigger topics like this um i did a three part cover on some economic reform ideas i might be doing some more of those coming up in the future and if you enjoyed content like that, uh, you know, shoot, say that you enjoyed it and we'll try to cover uh, more ideas like that and release more content like that. But till next week, thanks for getting into it and we'll see you on the road.